Good afternoon, everybody. I've got the after lunch uh, shift, so please try and keep, keep yourselves awake. Now, I'm just kind of really going to talk today a little bit um, about summarising some of the things that people have said um, and put people's minds at rest with, uh, particularly from a fire and rescue services point of view. Now, a couple of years ago, um, those of you who remember the Chief Fire Officers Association, we heard Nick Ross talk about it this morning. Um, the, the way the CFA, were, as it was known, worked, um, there was, we, we could improve that. As a result of that, the National Fire Chiefs Council was formed, um, which, for those who don't know, that means every Chief Fire Officer from every UK Fire and Rescue Service is part of a group. That group is, is, is very powerful because they all agree together and work together. So that means every fire and rescue service does the same thing and has the same kind of momentum. Um, now, in terms of sprinklers, um, we, we've, a lot of people have talked about Grenfell. Now, we've been doing a lot of work for uh, UK fire and rescue services for a number of years. We're not just doing this as a result of Grenfell. A lot of hard work has gone in. Two years ago, the National Fire Chiefs Council um, wanted some evidence uh, in order to publish some standard guidance, a position statement from the group on sprinklers. And they got a third party company in called Optima. Um, I don't know, is a, can I have a quick show of hands who's heard of that? Optima report, yeah. For those who don't know, that means we were looking into the effectiveness and the efficiency of sprinklers because we wanted proof. We looked at, or Optima looked at, results of 2,900 fires that had involved in buildings that had been fitted with sprinklers because we wanted to know whether they worked and whether they were efficient. We all here banded around that it keeps fires to compartments of origin and things like that but we wanted some hard hard facts so the national fire chiefs council did that um, and commissioned that report which is now published and, and and i would urge you to have a look at that um, so as a result of that uh, the nfcc national fire chiefs council produced a position statement for the sprinklers and as a, as a result that every fire and rescue service every chief fire officer and people like me um, will push and try and implement that position statement. So it's something we've been doing for a long time. We, we've heard uh, over the last the morning and, and last evening um, about changes in legislation and red tape. Nick Ross talked about red tape this morning. If we decide as a result of the Hackett review to review building regulations, which hopefully everybody in this room is in agreements with that that could take two to three years and we all know the impetus i spoke yesterday about the lessons learned from lackanel house harrow court uh, shirley towers of the fire deaths and injuries that we've had some things have been changed uh, equipment that we use as a fire and rescue service our procedures but fundamentally what hasn't changed is the buildings they are still there and the legislation still isn't there okay now if we waited for legislation to change um two to three years the impetus is gone and you know as well as me people forget okay so what the national fire chiefs council and the fire and rescue services across the uk we've been doing work with sprinklers for a number of years some fire services more than others in particular um derbyshire uh, Staffordshire, West Midlands and London Fire Brigade, uh, Cheshire, everybody has policies, strategies for implementing sprinklers. And uh, I'm getting growled at because uh, colleagues from Essex at the back there, um, they also are doing. So every fire and rescue service is doing something to do with sprinklers. And we've all got different priorities. Metropolitan fire services have different ways of doing things to like county services different 
times of mobilising fire engines and things like that. So we all have to act slightly different. In Staffordshire, um, we are targeting um, our 47 buildings that are five storeys and above. And we've done that because we're looking at the property. So high-rise buildings themselves are difficult to fight fires in. We have certain procedures that we have to put in place to protect our firefighters. We also have um, vulnerable people in our high-rise blocks. They are predominantly social housing. We do a lot of... Uh, fire services are split into prevent uh, side, which looks at the people, and the protect side, which looks at the buildings. Now, fire services are getting more acute now, and prevent and protect are working more closely together. Um, all your organisations internal communications is probably not as strong as it should be um, and, and we've all realised that so um, by using and working with evidence for from the prevent side looking at the people we know those people who are most at risk from fire um, it usually goes smokers people who are alcohol dependent people with mobility issues and the elderly and we know that those people are most at risk. Every fire and rescue service in the country carries out safe and well visits. They used to be called home fire risk checks. So we were looking at people and trying to protect them in their own house from fire. Safe and well visits go that step further. We're looking at safeguarding. We're looking at mental health issues. So it's better for one organisation to go in than lots of different agencies because um, it's just more efficient. Um, so we can target the people that are most at risk from fire, you know, those, those categories I've just said. So when we look at those people, where are they? We look at the buildings that are most at risk um, and, it all, and the, the risk to our firefighters um, fighting fires is in high-risk buildings. Um, all the recent fire deaths have either been in warehouses or high-rise buildings in the UK. So you put all those into a melting pot and it's high-rise buildings. Now, just a quick question to the floor. Who can tell me how you define a high-rise building? I can guess by that laugh. 18 metres. Anybody else? Over four floors. Okay, anybody else? 30 metres. So I look out amongst this room and we've got specialists from each different area of building environment and we've just come up with three answers, all different. Okay, fire and rescue services implement high-rise procedures at four-storey buildings and above. OK, so there's a fundamental issue there with our building regulations, uh, how we define buildings. So the Hackett Review has, all, has, has identified that. We, we, the Fire and Rescue Service have been saying that for a long time. We talk to architects under building regulation consultations and we ask for certain things that would be prominent in uh, a block of flats. And they say, well, it's not a block of flats, it's a hotel or their apartments. So there's lots of differential terms that people use um, within the built environment. And we're all trying to go for the same goal. So we need to work together. Now, the big thing that I've picked up from uh, yesterday evening and today is stakeholder collaboration. Um, I had a great chat with... Um, you yesterday from, from the architectural side. Now, the Fire and Rescue Services get consulted under building regulations for new builds, all right? Now, usually, by the time we see those plans and get involved in the consultation, it's already been built, all right? And then when we say, did you consider sprinklers? Well, it's too late now because we built it. That's just not good enough. And we all have a duty to... Um, the people, our communities, to keep them safe. There was an excellent presentation yesterday um, and they're talking about the life of a building. Buildings are designed for 80 years. 
<laughs> 80 years. So we have a responsibility as stakeholders in the built environment to make sure that building is fit for purpose for 80 years. Okay. Um, we talked, uh, there was an excellent presentation about uh, BIM yesterday. Um, now, that is a great innovation for uh, when buildings are built, they are, or intelligent buildings are built, you are given an operating manual, same as a car. So when you buy a car, in the glove box, there is always the user manual, isn't there? Well, buildings are supposed to have exactly that same thing. Now, I've been in fire safety for a few years now. I know it doesn't look like it, but I have. Um, uh, so, I can count on one hand the times that buildings have changed ownership and changed use, and I have seen that document, all right? Which is fundamentally wrong, because people are operating intelligent buildings who don't understand how they work and their fire strategy, okay? And that's something we, can, we need to, to address. And, and that's what BIM does. Um, and we've got an electronic copy uh, for that. So my final message is, um, it's great to have you all here from different parts of the built environment. But what I do urge you to do is work together. We don't all know everything. We've all got our specialisms, architecture, building regulations, fire safety. And we need to work together early doors when the building is being designed okay and going away from this meeting i've spoke to terry mcdermott who sits on the national fire chiefs council and we are going to look at doing some kind of work with reba the architectural governing body so that we can have some high level agreement where architects are encouraged um, to get fire and rescue services involved early doors so that we can iron out any myths about sprinklers, myths about building design, so that we can produce a better and safer built environment. Thank you very much.